Today, I'm gonna to show you 24 perennial spring blooming bulbs that you should buy now in fall for spring of next year. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a succession of spring blooms from March into summer. Uh, some of these are gonna be more popular garden choices like your tulips and daffodils, while others like snake's head fritillary, maybe you've never seen before. Hey, I'm Michelle from The Garden Spot, and it's my goal to help gardeners just like you grow a better backyard. Guys, it's almost September, uh, and that means that I am almost late for getting my bulb order in. Uh, so if you haven't ordered your bulbs yet, you need to do that as soon as possible because they uh, disappear so fast, and then when they're out, they're out. So if there's a particular variety that you see on this list that you wanna try out, make sure that you go ahead and get your purchase in now. Everything on this list is hardy to zone five or colder with lots of options that go into zone four and even into zone three. Um, I'm going to present these bulbs in the order that they're going to bloom in my garden so you can start to see what a succession of blooms might look like in your own garden. Um, and then stick around to the end because I'm going to give you some advice on growing bulbs, designing with bulbs, and I'm even going to put together a little plant palette so you can see what everything might look like together. Okay. So here's the list of 24 bulb varieties that I just purchased. Whew, 24 varieties. This is gonna be a long list. All right, number one, Iris Reticulata Claret. It's small, dainty, the first bloom in my garden. Uh, reticulated Iris come in shades of blue, purple, and white, but I chose Claret because it's the best performer out of a mix that I bought a few years ago. Uh, so iris reticulata and rock irises are native to Turkey and high elevations in the Middle East. So that can give you an idea of the kind of conditions that they want to grow in. They're hardy to zone five and in my zone five garden, they bloom from very, very late March into April and only last a few weeks. But the short bloom, at least for me, is totally worth it because by that time, I'm so starved from not seeing any color for the whole winter um, that it's worth all of this effort just for one week of a beautiful bloom. Um, and you know, they're actually something that I get more comments on than just about any other plant because not very many people are familiar with reticulated iris. Uh, and I hope I can help change that. I think more people should grow them. They're amazing little plants. So the Second bulb on my list is another Iris Reticulata, and this is Painted Lady. This is a new to me variety that I'm really excited to try. Uh, it should bloom at about the same time as Claret. It should have similar growing conditions. Um, so one last thing about Iris Reticulata in general, uh, I recommend that you plant them very, very close together. And um, this goes for the next thing on my list as well. Uh, these are small little plants. So if you spread them out, say if you put only one bulb per square foot, it's not going to have the impact that it would if you crammed, say, 15 into a square foot. So that should give you an idea of the kind of volume of bulbs that you want to buy if you want one of those grand displays. Number three, crocus to... <laughs> Number three, snow crocus, lilac beauty. There's a whole bunch of different snow crocuses that you can buy. Lilac beauty is my favorite. It's just, it's small, it's dainty, it's a really pretty color. I'm not usually in love with lilac, but with the way that the stems are a little bit white when they first come out and then just that touch of yellow, it really slaps in my landscape. So uh, snow crocus, native range is Southeastern Europe, hardy all the way down to zone three. These are commonly called Tommies. So they're the species crocus and reportedly squirrels don't love them as much as other varieties of crocus. Um, but in my experience, they still love them. So if you have a lot of squir uh, squirrels in your landscape, maybe you should stick with a reticulated iris. All right, number four. This is a miniature daffodil called Zit. They didn't call me before they named it. Honestly though, I think it's better than a lot of plant names. Zit, I don't know, sure, why not? <laughs> so uh, Zit is a miniature daffodil and like standard daffodils, these guys flower at different times. So there's gonna be early season, mid season and late season flowering miniature daffodils. I generally only buy early 
season miniature daffodils because I just think that otherwise they'll get lost in my landscape because I have a lot of taller stuff like tulips and larger daffodils that would otherwise just cover them up. So if you do go for a late season variety, consider planting them a little closer to the border so that you can actually see them. All right, so five through 12 are just a bunch of different varieties of daffodil that I'm growing this year. Uh, and don't worry, I'm gonna put a list of all of the varieties that I'm growing at the bottom so you don't need to be scribbling with a pen and paper. Um, I always get a big mix of daffodils because I, I love them. I, they're easy to grow, they come back reliably, they're reliably perennial. Um, they're just really trouble-free plants. I, I love them. Some of them smell incredible too. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I did not notice that until I planted 500 of them in my front yard. And all of a sudden one day, the smell just hit me and it was incredible. Oh my gosh, so fresh, so good, especially when you're coming out of winter and you haven't had a smell like that in a very long time. Okay, um, so a few of the varieties that I'm growing are um, Mount Hood, Watch Up, Stainless, Cheerful, White Lion, Thalia, which I so recommend. Ooh, that's a good, good daffodil, and Pueblo. Um, yeah, Thalia and Mount Hood are probably my favorites out of there. They're just, Thalia is just gorgeous. Um, it's delicate and there's like a little bit of movement to the petals. Meanwhile, Mount Hood is really tall on big sturdy stems. It's fragrant. It hangs on for a long time. So it, it's a nice transition daffodil as you move into those early summer plants. You might have noticed that these are all white daffodils. Yellow daffodils are amazing as well. I just don't grow them in my garden. I made a design choice a long time ago that uh, yellow and orange are great in other people's gardens and I will appreciate them in other people's gardens, but they just don't have a spot in mine. Uh, so nothing against yellow daffodils. There's some great varieties of yellow ones out there to try. Number 13, species tulips. So I am uh, doubling down on uh, Humulus Eastern Star because out of a species mix that I planted three years ago now, that was the one that's really stuck around for me. I don't know why I didn't have success with the other ones. I don't know if the squirrels just preferred those over this other variety or if it was something wrong with the site. But either way, this is the one that has lasted. So I'm just going to go ahead and get some more. Um, so species tulips are very, very cool. They're hardy uh, zone four to eight, native to the middle, the mountains of the Middle East. And so species tulips is a way to talk about a few different species of tulip that are generally non-hybridized, smaller and bloom a lot earlier than the classic tulip that you might be more familiar with. They're thought to be more perennial than other tulips. Um, and, you know, honestly, I've only been growing them for three years, so I really can't say yet, as three years is not long enough to know whether or not something's reliably perennial. So I took another species, Tulip Lady Jane, off of my list because after researching it a bit more, I realized that it might prefer a climate that is wetter and hotter than mine. So if you're in a zone six or seven, you might look into that. All right, number 14. Fritillaria. Snake's head fritillary is so weird and wonderful. The first time I saw it uh, was on an episode of Gardener's World. That's probably where most people first saw this amazing plant. And it is just bizarre. I could not believe that this thing really exists. And honestly, every single year that it comes back, I think to myself, like, what is this plant? <laughs> So strange. It's got almost like a checkered pattern and like a scaling quality to uh, to the petals. It's very, very strange. Um, absolutely recommend it. Hardy to zone three to eight. And this one is a little bit different than just about everything else on my list. So um, this is the only bulb on my list that prefers a moisture site. So if you have anywhere in your backyard that maybe is lower, so it collects more water, or uh, maybe under a downspout if you live in a drier area, this might be a good one for that site. Uh, that being said, 
I have mine just in my dry garden. You know, I only get 22 inches of rain a year, so they've been doing fine. Um, they're not flourishing the way that they might in a moisture yard, but they're holding on. So uh, they're just so amazing. Everybody should plant these guys. If you do decide to grow them, make sure that you get those corms in the ground immediately because they can dry out really fast and uh, then they'll die. Okay, number 15, the Grecian Windflower Anemone Blonda. I love this plant. It is such a cool plant. It's bright, it's cheery, it's whimsical. It's one of the few bulbs that actually has a nice foliage. The foliage kind of reminds me of like a geranium or a pasque flower. It's um, sort of like, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like the foliage is like cut out. Um, it's really, really pretty, but the foliage is nothing compared to the blooms. They're so gorgeous. I prefer the white variety and um, it's got just a little bit of pink right along the base of the petals and it opens up as soon as the sun comes out. It sticks around for a long time. Love it. Uh, zone five to eight. It looks really good underneath conifers. It can kind of make like a really pretty blanket around the base of your conifers. Um, looks great with muscari as well, which leads me to number 16, muscari. So most gardeners are familiar with this plant. It's really popular. Uh, it's one of my faves. It's reliably perennial. It's cheery. Um, yeah, I just love it in my garden. Some gardeners hate it. Uh, apparently in some climates it can spread. So make sure you do a little bit of research, figure out whether or not it's a good plant for you. Here in my garden, I would love it if it would spread by seed, but Alas, it does not. However, it is reliably perennial and the bulbs are very inexpensive. So it's a good one to try. Uh, my favorite variety is Valerie Finis. It's really uh, just this beautiful dull blue that looks amazing next to a fuzzy leaf of like a lamb's ear or a white daffodil. Oof, that's a really, really good combination to try. All right, uh, 17 through 22 are some tulips. So just first up, a note on tulips. So um, I'm always looking for tulips that are gonna be reliably perennial. My garden is primarily about sustainability. I don't wanna be watering stuff. I don't want to grow plants that take a ton of care unless you know they're in the special group of plants that I, I don't mind fussing over. I don't wanna fuss over my tulips. So I am always looking for ones that are gonna perennialize. Um, so most resources agree that tulips <laughs> mostly won't perennialize, but uh, a few that are, are the species tulips, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and the Darwin hybrids. So I'm growing Pretty Princess, Apricot Impression, Quebec, um, a green tulip, which are also supposedly reliably perennial. I don't know. I've never tried those before, but Esperanto and Chinatown, I think they're going to be gorgeous together. By the way, I just, um, even if the uh, green petaled tulips end up not perennializing well, I just love tulips with a bit of green on the petal. I think it's so fresh. Like it just looks like spring rain to me. Uh, they also have a bit of variegation on the foliage, which I'm really excited about because tulip foliage is just, you know, it's a little blah. It's not great. Um, and as far as whether or not they're going to perennialize, you know, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> my mom actually has a tulip that has been blooming next to her house for as long as I can remember. I just turned 30. So, I mean, that tulip has to be at least 15 years old. I mean... It's amazing. So I figure if she can do it, maybe I can too. We'll see. All right, number 24, Allium, oh no, Allium Carata Vanessi. So uh, the native range of this beautiful Allium, Central Asia, zones four to eight, and it is the single most sophisticated and elegant Allium I have ever seen. Um, it blooms from about late May to June. The seed heads look awesome after it's done blooming. Um, and I, I like to plant it with uh, Grecian windflower, which will kind of like cover or 
the Grecian windflower will carpet the ground before it starts to bloom. And then you'll see the blooms come up through the Grec Grecian windflower. And then that'll all die back. And it's just, oh, wow, it is so beautiful. Um, also try it with some of the muscari, especially the Valerie Finis. Gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. Um, oh, also I uh, tried throwing in some Siberian or bearded iris. That can look really, really nice as well, especially the peach varieties. That's a really, really strong color combination, at least in my garden. So uh, one thing to note is that the foliage looks like crap after about July, like mid-July. Well, it just depends on how hot it's gonna get. As soon as it gets hot, that foliage burns out and it looks terrible. So you also might think about planting this alongside something that's gonna be slow to get big when it's cool in the spring while your alliums look beautiful uh, and then quickly get bigger as soon as that hot summer heat hits. Um, so a few native plants to try might be yarrow, um, daisies might work, although their foliage might cover it a little bit. Another good option uh, would be like a big artemisia. Play around with it. Um, Rebecca would be nice. Coneflower would be nice. You get the picture. Just stuff that like gets going a little later in the season. Um, unlike other alliums, this guy is really short. So just so you know, from a design perspective, it, you might not want to bury it in your landscape if you've got other taller stuff that's going to be coming up in May. Number 24, Allium Christophii. So this is another Allium, uh, native range, Western Asia, Southeastern Europe, zone four to eight, blooms from, ugh, just a bee. Uh, so it blooms from June to July, seed heads free until the first big snowstorm. Um, and actually, hold on one second, I'm gonna show you one of the seed heads. Okay, so it is very early, early, early September, and look at how beautiful that is. So this is a dried out seed head. Um, massive, like just massive. It's gotta be a good, maybe not 10 inches, maybe more like nine, eight, but I mean, beautiful. Oh, I just love it so much. It's gonna just be here in this little bouquet, I think. Perfect. So. Photos do not do the color justice of this thing. It's got this metallic-y finish that just shines. I have friends that come over who don't garden at all. And it's like when this thing is blooming, they just like <laughs> are attracted to it. I catch my friends taking photos of it all the time because they've never seen a color like this on a plant. The only thing I can even compare it to would be like sea holly or oryngium not in color but in that metallic-y finish it's just bizarre it is so shiny um so like most alliums the foliage looks horrible um as soon as well honestly it looks horrible the whole time so um yeah it looks horrible so what you're gonna want to do is try to cover it up somehow Right now, I have mine covered up by some low-growing sedum as well as some nigella. Uh, sedum works really, really well. Nigella works fantastic if you don't mind that it's a heavy reseeder. It is an extremely heavy reseeder. So if that's not your style, <laughs> don't plant it. So those were my 24 fall-planted bulbs that we're going to be checking out next spring when they pop up. Now. Let's talk about designing with bulbs. In my opinion, the biggest mistake you can make buying bulbs is not buying enough. So I recommend that you buy as many as you can afford um, and plant them as close together as you can possibly stand it. Uh, they just look so lost and lonely unless they're planted really thickly. And if you want that look that you see in photos, you really have to get a ton of bulbs into a small amount of square footage. Um, so I use Van Engelen because they offer wholesale prices to regular gardeners like me. I am not sponsored by them. They have no idea who I am. Um, I just wanted to mention that because I've seen a lot of really, really sketchy um, 
old companies pop up lately and you want to watch out for the, those you want a reputable company and also you don't want to get ripped off so van england just has in my opinion the best prices but there are tons of other reputable reputable old distributors if um you don't want such a large quantity so just make sure that you check you can use um, a site like garden watchdog that can be really helpful just to see reviews of other people and find out what other people's experiences were with whatever supplier you choose. So uh, another, from a design perspective, most bulbs need full sun. So, um, but what's interesting about that is most of these bulbs are gonna be blooming well before, and they're gonna complete their life cycle even well before the canopy or the leaves of the rest of your garden flush out. So what might be shade in your garden right now, as you're looking around thinking about spring, will actually be full sun in the springtime. So um, yes, these bulbs need full sun, but they only need full sun from let's say March until late May. So my final big tip is to choose a plant palette that looks good together. Uh, no matter how well you plan it out, you're gonna, you'll make a mistake or something is gonna bloom early or late and then all of a sudden you're gonna have like a neon pink tulip next to a bright yellow daffodil or like a sports team purple next to like fire orange. Uh, and if that's your jam, right on, do it. But uh, if you care a little bit about um, aesthetic or you don't like when colors clash or something like that, I recommend that uh, you choose a color palette beforehand. I don't particularly like yellow or orange, as I mentioned earlier, so that was just really easy for me to say, no yellow, no orange. And the result is that no matter when something comes into bloom, I know it's gonna look good with everything else planted. It makes design so much easier if you just have a color palette picked out that you already like. Um, something that's really helpful for me is to just like copy and paste all the photos from the website, from your bulb supplier's website. And so then you can just look at them all together and you might notice something doesn't quite work or that peach doesn't go with that pink, whatever. Just pay attention to it if that's something that's important to you. All right, growing in your climate. How will these bulbs perform and whether they'll be right for your garden depends on where you grow. This list is for my garden, which, um, so let me tell you a little bit about my own garden so that you can better understand what's gonna work and what might not work for yours. I grow in USDA zone 5A, uh, which tells you the minimum, average minimum winter temperature, which is negative 15 to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Many of the plants on my list will grow from zone four to eight, but do check for each plant just to make sure that it's gonna work for you. Uh, many bulbs do well in cold climates like mine. Uh, in fact, a lot of southern gardeners have to chill their bulbs in order for them to get that cold dormancy period that they need to bloom. Um, but a zone or the minimum temperature does not tell you everything that you need to know to grow bulbs well. The second biggest factor is climate. I grow in the mountain west and high plains of the Black Hills, which has a similar climate to Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, Utah dry mountainous areas. These climates generally have snowy cold winters, dramatic freeze thaw cycle in the spring. Spring is generally wet, summers are hot and dry, and some moisture returns again in the fall. This is actually the ideal climate for growing the majority of bulbs, which makes growing bulbs a really easy and reliable task if you live in a dry cold area. For zones that are wetter and warmer, um, Sorry, growing bulbs is not gonna be as easy for you and it might not even be right for you. Uh, for me, part of the joy of growing bulbs is that they're so easy to grow. And as soon as something is no longer easy to grow and it takes a lot of my time and resources, it's just usually not the right plant for me. Uh, but you do have beautiful Japanese ma maples and dogwoods, so there you go. Bulb suppliers will generally say that bulbs grow best in sandy soils. But what I've found is that soil type isn't as important as that dry period in the summer. Uh, so what they what a bulb wants is to be able to grow it, start growing its roots in the fall, go dormant for the winter, start regrowing and blooming in the spring when the soil is nice and wet, and then be dry again while it's dormant in the summer. 
So if you grow in a climate similar to mine, cold winter, wet or spring, dry summer, then you'll likely find growing bulbs is pretty easy. Caring for your spring garden. So assuming you live in a climate like mine, you don't need to do anything to your bulbs. You don't need to water them. You don't need to fertilize them. There is no fussing necessary. Uh, unless you have just really, really bad soil, then maybe you want to consider fertilizing them. But honestly, just don't do anything to them. They don't need it. Uh, just plant them to whatever depth the uh, bulb supplier tells you to plant them to. Now, one thing uh, that is a hard and fast rule for all bulbs is to not cut the foliage back until it's brown. I know this can be really hard because the foliage is rarely attractive on bulbs, but um, the plant needs that energy for the next year. So if the foliage drives you crazy, instead think about different ground covers that you can use to cover that up once it falls over. I like to use um, a native cultivar of cerastium. I think it's just a beautiful plant. It's silvery, huge reseeder, so be aware of that if you choose it for your own garden, but I love it. I think it's beautiful. I also really enjoy lamb's ear, which has those beautiful silvery fuzzy leaves. Um, again, another reseeder, but also a native plant, so not such a big deal if it reseeds where you don't want it. Now, here's what I think they're gonna all look like together. That was a ton of info. So if you missed anything, check out my blog post on bulbs and my spring bulb guide linked in the description. You'll also find a list of everything I just bought in case something caught your eye. If you learned one new thing, please hit that like button and tell a friend. Part two of my series on growing spring bulbs is gonna be dropping really soon. So if you wanna catch it, hit subscribe. And that's all from the garden spot. I hope you get some time to get out and enjoy your own garden.